Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. This morning, we are in our second week of our new sermon series, For the Bible Tells Me So. And in this series, uh, we are going to look at some common words, uh, phrases, beliefs that are common in the church because we think they're from the Bible, but sometimes they are not. And even if they are, sometimes they're used in a way that's different than how the Bible says. So we're going to each week look at a different one and dive deeper into it, say, where does this saying come from? Why do we believe it? And is there a way that we as the people of faith can live this out a little bit better? So last week, we opened up our series with a classic, God Won't Give You More Than You Can Handle. And we said um, that we introduced this new idea called Wellspring Truthometer that we just completely took from Politico. So don't tell them we did that. But we said that this idea, God won't give you more than you can handle. Let's see what we said on the Wellspring Truthometer. It was mostly false. Not completely false because there is a verse in Scripture that, that talks about this, but mostly false because in Scripture it doesn't have to do with suffering or hardship. What did it have to do with? Temptation. See, you guys were paying attention. That's awesome. So we rated that as mostly false on the Wellspring truth meter But when Leaf and I sat down and brainstormed what the different topics would be for this series, we we're not originally going to include the one that was for this morning, but after various sermons on uh, the importance of the women in the Bible, on uh, most recently the general defense of women in leadership in the church, this is the topic that many of you have come up and asked for us to address specifically. So this morning our topic is women should be silent. And this is a very interesting one. How many of you have heard this taught in the church? Oh, yeah, quite a few. How many of you have attended churches that taught this or lived this out? Okay. Yeah, quite a few of us. This is a pretty common belief in church, although I think it might be the most inconsistently applied belief throughout churches because in some churches, women should be silent is interpreted as women can't preach from the pulpit. But in other churches, it is that women can't give announcements or welcome in the beginning of service. Uh, some churches, women aren't allowed to lead worship because that's not being silent. Um, but then with my work with the Junior Project, I heard from quite a few women who are in churches where the women can greet each other outside the building, but the moment they step inside the building, they cannot speak. So you have things from all, all of the spectrum, right? So, with what you know about this, how would you think the Wellspring Truthometer is going to rate <laughs> women should be silent? On a scale of 1 to 10, because Becky, that was really helpful last week, of 1 being completely false and 10 being completely true, where does women should be silent fall on the Wellspring Truthometer? A 0 from Marty, <laughs> a 1 from Steve, negative from Jeff, anyone else? Well, this might surprise you, but the Wellspring truth meter actually rated this as half true. I know, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> so Leaf is actually going to come up and finish the sermon. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> half true. I know, I know, I know. But just hear me out because it's not for the reason that you think, okay? <gasps> you are on to something, Becky. Uh-huh, mm-hmm. Yeah, you could actually just come up and give it. Yeah, no, yeah. you're good. <laughs> <laughs> so the belief that women should be silent in the church actually stems from two verses in Scripture. We have those up here. 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 12 and 1 Corinthians 14, 34. But the 1 Corinthians passage hardly ever comes up in the debate on women in the church anymore because no matter where you fall on the spectrum of what you believe on women, it is generally agreed by most theologians that this verse wasn't actually restricting women from speaking in the church. Um, and it's addressing how 
uh, disruptions were happening in the service. So that one hardly ever comes up. Even the uh, theologian that really represents hierarchical uh, thinking, Wayne Grudem, he even agrees with that for 1 Corinthians. So while there's consensus with 1 Corinthians and that that is not the actual thing when you take into consideration the context and the culture, that this might not be as clear as it seems in the English, go figure, there is not consensus in the same way about 1 Timothy. And this verse, there are a lot of avenues that we could take to address this verse this morning. Um, this is probably the verse that's most quoted to female pastors, in my experience. I don't know about you, Grace. Yep, probably. Um, and maybe, perhaps, to women in the church on the whole. But there are lots of things we could say about this verse. We could talk about the issues surrounding the problematic translations of 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. We could talk about the importance of the historical context and what was happening in the church that this letter was written to. We could talk about the strange Greek word that appears only in this verse and nowhere else in scripture. We could talk about the hermeneutical problems with saying that these verses apply to all women in all times, but none of the verses around it apply, like women braiding their hair, or not being able to wear jewelry, or not being able to wear expensive clothing, or men not being able to argue. We could talk about the fact that 1 Timothy is a personal letter written from one person to another person in a specific church, in a specific context, addressing specific issues at that church. We could talk about the problems that arise when these two verses are elevated above the rest of Scripture. And the many, many, many passages where Huldah and Deborah and Priscilla and Phoebe and Junia are all praised for teaching and leading men. We could talk about that. But this sermon is not about 1 Timothy 2.12. This sermon is about this belief that women should be silent. So I will stay on topic instead. Because no matter what you believe, when you hear these words, when you read this, no matter how visceral your reaction, they are in Scripture, right? This verse is here. And Paul is writing this letter, some think, to a co-worker, Timothy, in the church at Ephesus. And he is dealing with specific issues that are coming up in that church. And in this letter, Paul does restrict the voices of some women in the Ephesian church. That is why this phrase one of the reasons why this is not labeled as completely false on our truth meter But there are two important things to keep in mind when you are thinking about this idea that women should be silent in the church, especially when it comes to 1 Timothy. And that is that the word that is often translated as silent in this passage is actually better translated as quietness. And this distinction is an important one because if you are silent, you're not making any noise, right? But if you're quiet, you're not disrupting anyone with your noise. See the difference? One restricts everything that you might say, and one says to do it at a certain decibel level. And in this passage, we see that something very important is going on. Women are learning. Women should learn in quietness. Well, that's revolutionary. Women are sitting in church alongside men and learning here. And in this culture, the time of the New Testament, that was not very common from different culture to different culture or different church context to different church context. So we see here that women are actually learning. We see this also in 1 Corinthians 14. Just fascinating. And so when the women are told to be silent, especially or quiet, especially in 1 Corinthians we see this because it says, as the law says, we realize that the women are told to be quiet not because they're women, but because they're students. They're new learners. And we don't want them to be asking questions and disrupting the service when they could just ask that at home. And they should be quiet and learning. When you look into the Jewish belief on learning and quietness, this is upheld. That's why it says as it says in the law. Because this was a general idea. Students were supposed to be submissive and quiet in their learning. That's how, that's your posture as a student. 
So unlike most public spaces of the day, women in the New Testament churches were learning alongside men. And this was new. So they were taught to be quiet as they learned. So in our day and age, it's really difficult to conceive of women and girls not being educated as they are graduating from college and getting master's degrees at higher levels than men are. So this is a very different cultural context than the one that we find ourselves in. So the first important thing to note is that this word that's translated as silent is really better understood as quiet. Not that you can't say anything, but that you should keep your stuff at a low decibel, not to disrupt those around you. And not because you are women, but because you are new to this. The second important note to make about this idea that women should be silent is that quietness is not a uniquely feminine attribute in the Bible. So I'll say that again in a different way. Women aren't the only ones encouraged to be quiet in Scripture. In fact, women aren't the only ones encouraged to be quiet in the book of 1 Timothy. In fact, women are not the only ones encouraged to be quiet in the second chapter of the book of 1 Timothy, which I find fascinating because 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2 says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So that all of us can live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So interesting that the same chapter that has 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 12, that's so often quoted to say women should be quiet or silent, also tells all the people of God to do that. Isn't that fascinating? You would think that it wouldn't be so easily overlooked. But maybe that's because it shows up nowhere else in scripture. I don't know. Let's see. Is quietness a feminine virtue throughout the Bible? Genesis 25, 27 talks about Jacob as a quiet man at home that is different from his brother Esau. 1 Kings 19 says that God's voice is found in the gentle and quiet breeze. 1 Chronicles 22, 9, quietness is a blessing from God. Isaiah 30, quietness is strength. Isaiah 32, quietness is the fruit of righteousness. It's what righteousness produces in someone's life. Psalm 4, God calls David to search his heart in silence. Psalm 131, David quiets himself as he puts his hope in God. Proverbs 19, quietness is prudence. Proverbs 11, quietness shows understanding. Proverbs 17, quietness shows wisdom and discernment. Proverbs 29, quietness shows wisdom. Lamentations 3, people are to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Habakkuk 2, the whole earth, the whole earth is called to be quiet before God. 1 Thessalonians 4, the church is encouraged to live quiet lives. 2 Thessalonians 3, the church is told to work quietly for God. And James 1, let every person be quick to listen, but slow to speak, quiet. So although some have said that the Bible commands the silence of women, Although some have picked out these two verses and used them as weapons against women, although some may be trying to keep women from the microphone or the pulpit, throughout the Bible, from the Old Testament to the New, quietness is something that is a virtue for the people of God. And it is not uniquely feminine. It is wise and prudent for all of the people of God, especially when you look into the context of many of these verses to know where you are. Is the world around you unsafe? Well, then be quiet. It is wise to know when to speak and when not to. So 1 Timothy does indeed call women to quietness. It also calls all people to quietness. This call to the women isn't a differentiation of how women are to act versus how men are to act. It seems to be Someone calling this group of women back to the behavior of all people. All people are supposed to be quiet. Perhaps they were not being so, and so they were being called back to that. 
We are encouraged to live gentle and quiet lives, have gentle and quiet spirits, learn in gentleness and submission, following the wisdom of restraint, restraining of the tongue, being slow to speak, quick to listen. This is what we are called to as the people of God. And what's fascinating about this is women being told to be silent is so harsh in our culture because none of us are silent, <laughs> right? We speak to everyone that we see here on Sunday morning. We speak in a way on social media all throughout the week. We let our voices and our opinions and our distaste or our enjoyment known. We let it be known constantly. That is our culture. So for one group of people to be told to be quiet or silent, that just rubs us the wrong way. But in a culture where all people are called to be quiet, all are told to be silent, you could see how if one group was speaking up at a turn or in a weird way, they might be asked to come back to the, to the norm, right? This is such an interesting thing because I think we really struggle, both men and women, on the contemplative quietness. I've learned a lot from Grace and Steve Sabalka over the last few years, Leif and I both have, in, in joining them. Um, they even invited us on a retreat at the beach, and it was so great. But our, uh, one of the things we were told to do was to go and be quiet for how many hours did we do that? It felt like 12. Okay. <laughs> it was three hours. <laughs> we had to go and be totally quiet. Don't say anything. Don't say anything to anyone. Don't interact. And just be in the presence of God. And it was so powerful. But it's difficult for us. And being quiet and being silent, being contemplative, these are things that we actually have to carve out time in order to do in our world, which is another thing that we are not good at, right? We are so busy and our lives are so full of so many things to do. It's almost as if it needs, we need a fast from our normal stuff that's going on to make the room to be quiet, to be silent, to take that time. Something I'm not very good at, especially not with a baby right now. Nothing's quiet. But this is what we are called to. And I encourage all of us to be people who make time to have a little bit of quiet, to learn what this might be to to contemplate things, to be before God without words. I know that we can grow a lot from that. So the Wellspring truth meter rates women should be silent as half true. But that's not because women are supposed to be quiet. It's because all of us are. Because it's only half the truth to only tell one group that this is what the Bible calls them to. Because the Bible calls all of us to this quiet time of reflection. For all people, both women and men, may we be those who live peaceful, gentle, and quiet lives before God. Amen.